Uh, but today we are here with Joe William Trotter Jr. to discuss his book, Workers on Arrival, Black Labor in the Making of America. Maybe I'm wondering if Joe, if you have a copy and, and you feel like uh, holding it up, that would be wonderful. Um, so you guys can get, get a look at it. Beautiful. Is that, is that yeah, video? that's perfect. And then maybe a little higher too, so they can see the tagline a little higher. Okay. That's beautiful. Um, and the book is available from Booksmith now. Um, I will drop the link um, in the chat shortly. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book, and then and then Joe will take over. Um, a couple of house items before we do that. Um, you're muted, obviously, but I encourage you to ask questions in the chat at any point. We will have a Q and A at the end of the program. We do have a one strike policy in the chat. Any hate speech will result in you being removed and you won't be able to get back in. This is gonna be an excellent event, so don't do that to yourself. Um, uh, yeah, so um, a little bit about the book. Uh, from the ongoing issues of poverty, health, housing, and employment to the recent upsurge of lethal police community relations, the black working class stands at the center of perceptions of so social and racial conflict today. Journalists and public policy analysts often discuss the black poor as consumers rather than producers, as takers rather than givers, and as liabilities instead of assets. In his engrossing new history, Workers on Arrival, Joe William Trotter Jr. refutes these perceptions by charting the black working class's vast contributions to the making of America. Covering the last 400 years since Africans were first brought to Virginia in 1619, Trotter traces black workers' complicated journey from the transatlantic slave trade through the American century to the demise of the industrial order in the 21st century. At the center of this compelling fast paced narrative are the actual experiences of these African American men and women. A dynamic and vital history of remarkable contributions despite repeated setbacks, Workers on Arrival expands our understanding of America's economic and industrial growth, its cities, ideas, and institutions, and the real challenges confronting black urban communities today. Joe William Trotter Jr. is Giant Eagle Professor of History and Social Justice and founder and director of the Center for African American Urban Studies and the Economy at Carnegie Mellon University. He's the author of Black Milwaukee and Coal, Class and Color and past president of the Labor and Working Class History Association. Um, that's it for me, you guys. Um, Joe, thank you so much for being here and um, uh, congratulations on the book. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Evan, for that introduction. Um, you actually just allowed me to take about the first three pages off of my uh, presentation <laughs> by giving that context on the book. You know, I appreciate that so I can deal with other things. Uh, but I just want to say I'm very, very happy to be here and to know that Booksmith is uh, partnering uh, with the University of California Press, uh, the publisher of Workers on Arrival, and so this is a great opportunity uh, for me. And as I mentioned, you know, before uh, we came on air, um, I do believe this is the first uh, actual talk that I've given on Labor Day itself. And so this is a, an, a, an important moment, you know, for my career as a labor historian. I think this is the 126th celebration of Labor Day in U.S. history. Uh, so I will mark this one. And Labor Day is an especially important uh, day because we, we should uh, recognize the contributions of working people every day, you know, and every week throughout the year. Uh, but too often working people are undervalued and underappreciated. And I think this is a day for us to really think deeply about the contribution working people make, you know, to the nation. Uh, so I'm happy to be here and uh, in fact, um, um, workers on arrival uh, grew out of my uh, profound sense uh, that we needed to really uh, bring uh, to the attention of the public uh, greater um, focus on black workers uh, in the making uh, of America, especially as we sort of move toward the 400 year mark uh, on African American history, you know, in North America. And so and I, I also think strongly that we have to uh, celebrate um, the working class in broad strokes because it's a, the American working class is very diverse. And sometimes our celebrations are not as diverse as the actual working class that, that we talk about in terms of racial diversity, ethnic diversity, sexuality, 
all kinds of ways in which we um, have a diverse working class in the United States. And we should celebrate all of those workers that are playing a role. And so today I want to talk about particularly the African American uh, experience. Uh, one of the things that I just want to uh, reiterate in part of that three page section I got rid of is that uh, I wrote the introduction to this book uh, in the wake of the 19, uh, 2016 presidential election, you know, where that stunning defeat of Hillary Clinton by Donald Trump. And following that election, as you may recall, there was a great deal of outpouring of discussion about the working class and the role it plays in American politics, particularly the conservative, conservative trend in American uh, political history. Uh, but a lot of that talk, um, in, in fact, most of it tended to put white workers front and center of that particular uh, phenomenon and tended not to treat African-American women and other minorities as part of the mainstream of the American working class, like white workers and particularly conservative white workers were taking over uh, the conversation. And so one of the things I want to do here in this, what I wanted to do in the book is just call attention to the way black workers have been central to the development of the American working class uh, from the beginning. Um, and uh, I have to, you know, disclose that the book itself is about black urban workers. That's the centerpiece of that study is black urban workers. And so there needs to be a word or two about why did I decide that it was so important and why did I find it compelling to tell a story about, about black urban workers uh, from the transatlantic slave trade to the present. And one reason is that so much of what we talk about and especially in the past about the black experience in America has been focused on rural agricultural workers. Uh, but that's an important facet of the black working class experience. And it is the predominant facet of the black working class experience before the Civil War. And so we don't want to underestimate the importance of this rural experience. Um, and in looking at uh, the impact of cotton, for example. By 1850, the United States produced an estimated 1 billion pounds of cotton. In the same year, cotton exports brought into the country $72 million. This represented nearly 50% of all the export sales of all products in the United States. So at this point, never before or since, has one crop so dominated the U.S. economy as cotton did at that time. And it owed its very existence to slave labor. So it owed its existence to the black working class. Um, and if we add tobacco, sugar, rice, and other slave uh, produced staples, then we know that it's just an overwhelmingly rural proletariat that we're talking about. An overwhelmingly and enslaved rural proletariat. Um, so, so we want to keep that as context. But on the other hand, um, we shouldn't wait until the Great Migration to begin talking about Black urban workers. And so this book is about foregrounding this early history of the Black urban worker from the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade, right along with people moving to plantation, other people were moving into cities and they were helping to build these cities and expand their economies and so on. So the talk that I'll give today is a story about urban black workers. It's not only a story about, you know, the vast majority of these workers who work as household servants, um, personal attendants, um, what, what is called common labor or so-called unskilled labor, moving products back and forth across the landscape. That labor was very important and central, but also I want to talk about the skilled African worker. Enslaved Blacks had a variety of jobs that they performed. And so today I want to take a closer look 
at this particular component of the black working class, okay? So let's get started. From the moment that they set foot on American soil, enslaved African workers helped to build American cities as well as plantations and farms. African labor fueled the rise of such cities as New York, Philadelphia, and Boston, as well as Southern cities, Charleston, New Orleans, Baltimore, and others. From the early years of Boston City on a Hill, Bay Colony residents clearly expressed their hope, quote, to secure a sufficient number of enslaved people to do all their general labor and household work. In Quaker, in Quaker, Pennsylvania, as white indentured servants declined in numbers, Philadelphians lobbied for, quote, the more general recruitment of enslaved African labor to replace free but expensive white labor. Urban black workers did the heavy lifting, cleaning, hauling, and transporting of people and goods across the urban landscape, north and south. But they also performed a variety of skill jobs in the building and construction of the early American city. Wealthy merchants, businessmen, and artisans employed African brick masons, carpenters, cabinet makers, bakers, and many other crafts. Some of these black craftsmen received training in Africa before arrival in North America. Others were purchased, trained, and employed on the ground in North America by European merchants, businessmen, and artisans. By the eve of the American Revolution, according to W.B. Du Bois, Philadelphia had placed, quote, a large share of the city's skill jobs in the hands of enslaved artisans. By the late, by the late 18th and early 19th century, some, some scholars say that this became a kind of golden age of the black artisan. They were used so widely in the urban economy. In Southern cities like New Orleans, as one historian notes, Europeans founded the major cities, but enslaved African workers laid the foundation. African workers from the Senegal to Congo helped to actually build all uh, those cities. They not only cultivated the land and built the levees in New Orleans, but also framed the houses, plastered the walls, and shingled the roofs. Black craftsmen also forged the metal tools that made the barrels that stored all kinds of cargo. These products were carried to market in wagons and carts, constructed and maintained by the hand of black craftsmen. So these early black urban workers were critical to the economy alongside the workers who were doing the the sort of heavy lifting and all of that. Um, colonial and early American factories also employed enslaved black workers. After the American Revolution, Southern capitalists launched aggressive movements to industrialize the South on the basis of enslaved labor. By the early 19th century, Southern urban capitalists pledged to end dependence on manufactured products from the Northeastern states. They placed a rising number of enslaved workers in cotton and woolen factories, in iron furnaces, in tobacco factories, in sawmills and rice mills, and so these African workers not only worked in skilled jobs and so-called unskilled jobs, 
but they all, and I'm talking within the context of the city, but they also worked in the emerging factory system, the emerging industrial system. And some of these men, enslaved men, remarkably, not only worked as factory hands, but they also became skilled factory builders. In South Carolina, for example, the enslaved man named Anthony Weston became what entrepreneurial historians call a slave, a successful slave entrepreneur and skilled, and skilled mechanic. Weston built a number of rice mills for slave owners all along the Cooper and Ashley Rivers. Uh, one, in 1856, one planter described a Weston built mill as, quote, better than any on the river, end of quote. So in other words, even as the vast majority of Black people lived and labored on plantations and farms, significant numbers lived and worked in urban as well as rural industrial environments. In many ways, this pre-industrial Black working class foreshadowed the rise of the 20th century Black industrial working class. Beginning gradually during the late 19th century, the Great Migration escalated during World War I and its aftermath. The Great Migration slowed but did not stop during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Massive Black population movement to American cities reignited during World War II and ran its course by the early 1970s. Over the entire period, an estimated 8 million African Americans moved from the rural and urban South to the North and West. And so, in a way, when we talk about the Great Migration and the rise of this urban, Black urban industrial working class, we often talk about it as a radical break with the past. But if we look back at the pre-industrial Black working class of the 18th and 19th centuries, we begin to see that there are some continuities over time in the way the Black working class uh, developed. But in the 20th century, for the first time in the nation's history, African-American workers not only became a predominantly urban people, they also became a national Black population spread almost equally across the urban South, North, and West. By the end of World War II, whereas most Blacks had previously worked predominantly in agricultural production, 75%, nearly 75% of all African Americans now work in the nation industrial sectors, in railroads, shipbuilding, meatpacking, steel, rubber, and automobile industries. The African American urban working class in the 20th century had moved from the periphery of the Black proletariat during the 18th and 19th centuries to its center during the 20th century, during the industrial era. And when we look back at it and we compare the early, uh, the antebellum Black urban experience with the 20th century Black Great Migration experience, we begin to see how cities represented a kind of a, a, a magnet uh, for African-American uh, seeking to change the terms on which they lived and labored. And indeed, in both of these periods, you can begin to see that Blacks celebrated their movement into these cities. Cities opened the door to higher wages, the prospect for better living conditions, and access to greater freedom. By the onset of the Civil War, for example, the number of free people of color had increased to nearly a half million, double the number of free Blacks 
in 1820. The early 19th century also provided African Americans opportunities to build their first formal institution, churches, fraternal orders, and other organizations. This is the era where the African Methodist Episcopal Church was formed. It was formed during this period. And the Prince Hall Mason, Masonic Order. So these cities provided opportunities uh, that, um, that uh, black workers uh, took advantage of. The 20th century great migration rise of the industrial working class represented an even more profound moment of excitement and hope in African-American history, in general and African-American labor history in particular. Newcomers regularly refer to their homes in biblical terms as the promised land, the new Jerusalem, and land of hope. So we can't underestimate the degree to which cities represented a kind of upward mobility, so to speak, for Black people during both eras in U.S. and Black labor history. But neither the pre-industrial nor the industrial city fully delivered, fully delivered on its promise for Black people during the pre-industrial years, for example. So in other words, there was a downside, an important, an important critical downside to Black working class life in urban areas. During the pre-industrial years, for example, that so-called golden age of the Black artisan soon disappeared. Between the end of the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, an estimated 3.7 million immigrants, mostly Irish and German, entered the nation. Across the early Republic, German and Irish immigrants pushed the black artisans more and more to the wall. By the onset of the Civil War, the black artisan class had dwindled to a fraction of its former self. As free people of color lost artisan jobs, they worried that they were becoming a race of servants. In other words, they were being pushed out of the lucrative skill craft into the less, um, into the lower paying jobs in the household and personal service uh, sector of the economy. The early 19th century black woman activist Maria Stewart complained during the time. She said, and I quote, how long shall the fair daughters of Africa be compelled to bury their minds and talents beneath a load of iron pots and kettles, end of quote. Martin Delaney, a migrant from Virginia to Pittsburgh he also complained, quote, our fathers are their coachmen, our brothers, their cookmen, and ourselves, their waiting men, end of quote. Delaney said the occupation of servant was not necessarily degrading, but he said a whole race of servants are degradation to that people. And so this is a critical moment. The cities offered excitement, opportunity. At the same time, over time, those opportunities were compromised and curtailed severely. African Americans not only lost their footing in the gill craft of the antebellum city, they also encountered rising levels of white hostility and violence. The American Colonization Society, formed in 1816, spearheaded a vigorous campaign to recolonize free people of color on African soil and remove them from the urban environment. The urban environment housed disproportionately larger numbers of free people of color. They were the most urbanized sector of American society at that time. 
grassroots white intimidation and mob violence reinforced this movement to remove blacks from American soil, free blacks in particular. In Cincinnati, Philadelphia, and Providence, Rhode Island, mobs converged on black communities, destroying churches, businesses, and homes, and driving many blacks out of the city. In some cases, early 19th century mobs plundered and sold the household property of African Americans before burning their homes. So that's the 19th century downside of the making of a black urban working class. But then the 20th century, if you fast forward to the 20th century, you will see black people contributing to the development of the urban environment. They contributed to the uh, development of the pre-industrial city. And in the great migration era, black workers powered the nation's industrial machine but they did so on a segregated and unequal basis. As much as they celebrated their movement into the urban North and West, they did, they worked almost exclusively in the lowest paying, hot, heavy, and dangerous jobs. They also lived in racially segregated and unhealthy neighborhoods. They were exposed to higher rates of diseases and death than their white neighbors. And this is a place where I'd say, those of us who are trying to understand the disproportionate racial impact of COVID-19, we have to go back and to do some serious work on the way that African-American labor and living condition exposed them historically to higher rates of diseases, epidemics, and pandemics. In the steel industry, African-Americans manned the blast furnaces and performed the most difficult jobs making rails for the railroads. In the meatpacking houses, they spent the bulk of their working days on the killing floor, slaughtering livestock, transporting entrails, and cleaning the factory. In the coal mines, they worked in low coal where they had to crawl on their knees to make their way to the good coal through excessive water, rock, and bad air. As one miner later recalled, quote, I have been sick and dizzy off that smoke many times. That deadly poison is there. It would knock you out, make you weak as water, end of quote. And so I'm saying that black industrial workers, as well as black pre-industrial workers, they paid a heavy cost, a heavy price for the work that they did and for the opportunities that they received compared to their rural counterparts. But the challenges of work in these eras in Black labor history extended well beyond the workplace. Um, in fact, both eras entail the construction of white supremacist regimes. And in the 20th century, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan underscored the emergence of a new white supremacist racist regime. The Ku Klux Klan formed after the Civil War to intimidate rural Blacks reinvented itself as an urban phenomenon. The Klan followed the great migration of Black people into the industrial cities of the urban North, South, and West. In August 1921, an estimated 10,000 Klansmen attended initiation ceremonies on Chicago's north side. The Imperial Wizard traveled from Atlanta to preside over this northern uh, initiation uh, ceremony. The Detroit Klan, founded in 1921, enrolled 22,000 members over the next two years. 
In May 1921, the Klan established several chapters in Philadelphia. Philadelphia Claverns, as they were called, took such names as Liberty Bell Clan Number One, Old Glory Clan Number Five, and the William Penn Clan. In 1925, the Klan staged their famous national parade at the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. In the meantime, violence broke out in East St. Louis, Tulsa, Chicago, and other major cities. In the Chicago riot, some 1,000 people were left homeless. These violent assaults on Black urban communities reinforced the spread of racially segregated neighborhoods. Between World War I and 1930, the size and number of separate, unhealthy, and dilapidated Black neighborhoods increased. Uh, it became what some historians call the making of the first ghetto. In addition to homeowners association, banks, real estate agencies, municipal zoning policies, and violent grassroots white opposition to open housing, the federal government added to the problem. Federal programs helped to underwrite a system of racially segregated and unequal public and private housing. At the same time, between the early 1950s and 1973, urban renewal programs called Negro Removal by Black residents demolished some 2,500 urban neighborhoods and extended housing segregation into nearly 1,000 U.S. municipalities. These projects included Pittsburgh's Lower Hill District, Detroit's Paradise Valley, and the Bay Area's West Oakland neighborhood. Now, the picture I'm painting is that we have to see the complexity of the way the Black working class developed in both periods in U.S. history, and we have to see how there's this sort of upside where they are celebrating an expanded range of opportunities against the backdrop of those very terrible conditions in Southern agriculture during the period of enslavement and in sharecropping during the late 19th and early 20th century. But at the same time, when they compared their conditions to white workers that were making in many ways the trek to the city at the same time, then they saw that the racial system was replicated in important ways in these new urban environments. And those systems undercut their capacity to gain full citizenship rights, economic democracy, and sort of actually human rights even, because in the context of all of these changes, there were great violations of the humanity and civil rights of Black peoples. But one of the things that I want to stress in the next few minutes is that Black workers from the transatlantic slave trade to the late industrial period and beyond, they did not take these kind of conditions sitting down, they were active in trying to find strategies, develop strategies and responses to their condition that enabled them to alleviate some of the most difficult hardships that they face in the urban environment. They forged a broad range of strategies for changing the terms on which they lived and worked. I don't have time to go through all of these various strategies, but the one that emerges as a pivotal strategy is the idea of building independent African-American institutions, building what they came to call the Black metropolis even as their labor 
constructed the American metropolis across the country, across all regions. They were building American cities that were dominated by America's political, economic, and cultural elites. They were helping to build those cities. But in the context of adding their labor, exploited labor, we might say, to the building of these cities, they were taxing themselves at the same time to build independent Black institution in their own neighborhoods and to construct this Black metropolis. And so they were paying a price to build the American city, to build their own city. And so what do I mean by this? The Black metropolis, as we talk about it in historical circles and in historical research, the Black metropolis flourished during the era of the Great Migration, after World War I, during and after World War I, all the way through the interwar years. But this metropolis had deep roots in the pre-industrial era of the 19th century. In the North, as early as 1787. Now, this is the late 18th century. And notice one of the things I try to do in Workers on Arrival is to give credit to Black workers as founding institution builders, as founders of Black institutions. Too often, when we talk about the founding and development of major Black institutions, we sort of privilege an emphasis on Black elites, you know, the educated, the wealthy, being sort of the vanguard in these developments. But even some of those people had roots in the working class, and they may have moved and advanced economically and so on. But the way in which working class people constituted the core of Black institution building activities in the pre-industrial and industrial era of the 20th century is part of what I try to do in the book, is to underscore the working class basis of these institutions. In 1787, Boston hairdressers, cooks, and boot blacks, among other workers, formed the Prince Hall Masonic Order. Prince Hall, the founder, was a skilled leather worker and soap maker. In Philadelphia, Black people met in a blacksmith shop and formed the African, the Free African Society. And this society, in turn, uh, stimulated the rise of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And Richard Allen, the founder or the spearheader of the AME Church, was an ex-slave who had worked in a broad range of jobs as butcher, woodcutter, day laborer, brickyard hand, salt wagon driver, and shoemaker. He had worked across a whole range of jobs that placed him squarely within the Black working class. In 1796, in New York City, carpenters, shoemakers, janitors, and other workers spearheaded the formation of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church called AMEZ. And this church was very, you know, class conscious, of course, but it was very nationalistic as well in terms of African consciousness. Uh, and, a, and a determination to unify and create solidarity among African people. When you look at the Articles of Incorporation in that church, in February 1801, New York State issued uh, Articles of Incorporation to the organization. And the Articles of Incorporation specified, quote, that only Africans or their descendants qualified for membership and election to the Board of Trustees. The congregation also decreed that church property 
belong, quote, to our African brethren and the descendants of the African race, end of quote. And so working people were at the core of these institution building, early institution building activities. And so this is in a way a labor movement of sorts. And so that when we talk about the labor movement within African American history, we cannot dismiss churches, fraternal orders, and clubs as sort of social, not labor, organizations. So, but they were very labor oriented. And when you add their mutual benefits uh, societies to the mix, then they become even much more um, labor in their material um, uh, role, the material role that they play. But these black workers built institutions in the North, but they also built institutions in the South. And in the South, as in the North, working people are at the helm of these organizations. In South Carolina, Morris Brown, a free black shoemaker, spearheaded the formation of the African Methodist Episcopal Church in the city. By the way, once Philadelphia gained stature, the AME gained stature as an organization that was empowered to spread across the country and set up new churches. Then it moved into the South. And in this case, Morris Brown took the lead in building a church that affiliated with the Philadelphia organization. In Savannah, the Black Baptist Church movement faced an uphill battle under the leadership of Andrew Bryan, a slave minister on a nearby uh, plantation. And so we have working people building all these institutions uh, during the um, early 19th century and the late 18th century. So I could go on and on about this, but I'm gonna bring it to a close now. I'm gonna bring it so that you will have a chance or we'll have a chance uh, to engage some questions and some conversation about what all this means. Uh, in addition to churches, I want to point out that early 19th century Black communities not only built fraternal orders, churches, and so on, they also built businesses, um, restaurants, um, barbershops, uh, all kinds of businesses that catered to the Black public, hotels, um, dressmaking establishments, catering businesses. They built, they built a lot of businesses. But during the 20th century, many of these business, these businesses became much more extensive and in many ways more specialized. Um, and is in the era of the Great Migration that you begin to see just the proliferation of what became known as Black Business Districts, the BBD, the Black Business District. And by the onset of the Civil War, however, Black Southerners in cities across the South had built these Black Business Districts. Louisville, Norfolk, Birmingham, Atlanta, Houston, Memphis, all of these cities had established these business districts. So that my argument is that we can't understand the fluorescence of black business in the urban North during the 1920s, where we start talking about the black metropolis. St. Clair Drake and Horace R. Caton wrote a book in 1945, you know, called The Black Metropolis and talked about the businesses that were established. But these businesses were established mainly by Southern migrants who brought a vision of business development as well as questions of labor and all of that into the urban environment during the 1920s. And so when we look at a place like Detroit, they built the famous stroll located on State Street in the heart of the Black Belt. In New York, they built Seventh Avenue. In Detroit, it was Hastings Street. In Los Angeles, Central Avenue. 
in Pittsburgh Wiley Avenue, just up the road from Carnegie Mellon University where I worked and the University of Pittsburgh. Um, Wiley Avenue was considered a dynamic, thriving and bustling place. It was dubbed the crossroads of the world. There was never a dull moment. People never went to bed. And if you look at all of these places across the urban north during the 1920s, these stories are repeated over and over again. And so that black metropolis was a way to deal with a very exploitive labor and social environment. But what I wanna say in conclusion is that black people didn't just use the black metropolis to go shopping and to go to theaters and enjoy music and dance. They used this black metropolis to launch movements against class and racial inequality. During the early 19th century, the pre-industrial black city served as a launching pad for the abolitionist movement that helped to demolish the institution of slavery. A century later, African-Americans employed the black metropolis to launch the modern black freedom movement that toppled the Jim Crow order. And so we have to see black workers at work, at home, and in the community. They were struggling against all kinds of odds, but they built responses to labor exploitation and inequality that help to alleviate and improve their lives. Thank you. So I'll take questions if people have items they want to explore. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, so much for this talk. It's really been um, informative and, and um, centering uh, on Labor Day. Um, so we, we really appreciate you being here today. Okay. Um, and All right. The uh, for those of you who, who, are, who are tuned in, um, if you have any questions at all for Joe, um, drop them in the comments or the chat, and um, he'll be happy to answer them. Um, we do have a few that have come in. Um, uh, the first is from Alex, um, who is wondering, in addition to the churches and fraternal orders, uh, can you tell us about how labor unions functioned in organizing efforts for Black workers? Um. You know, I, I have to say that um, labor unions, white labor unions, uh, certainly were very discriminatory, you know, exclusionary. And so what we find in this period is that there is not a lot of support uh, for black people in their struggles coming from organized white labor, which was very much skilled labor that even mistreated and excluded white workers who were not in that skilled range of categories. They were not artisans, independent. So there wasn't a lot of help there. But what we do see is that African-American workers early on, at least by the late antebellum period. Um, but let me just back up a second. When I said that Black fraternal orders and all of those things should not be construed as, as something other than labor union, Often these organizations had improvement of black workers' lives as a major, major objective of organizing. Even the church becomes an important point of helping workers find a better life. But at the same time, there were labor organizations among blacks that they formed. And one of these was organized in New York City in 1850. And it was called the American League of Colored Laborers. And it, it aimed to Im improve the lives of self-employed black artisans um, and to help them to find a footing. So even black workers, you know, the organization tended, you know, the former organization like that tended to touch on, you know, skilled artisan kind of life, but not exclusively. In, in Baltimore, uh, black people formed an, an association called the Association of Black Caulkers uh, in 1858. And they formed that organization to resist Irish and German immigrants who were seeking to drive them out of the ship caulking trade in Baltimore. And so there was organization, you know, labor uh, more explicitly, if people are interested in explicitly labor 
uh, kinds of organizations, though there were those. But not only that, during the uh, 19th century, African Americans organized these large conventions, what were called the Black Convention Movement. And in these conventions, um, they were held in different places around the country, in, including Philadelphia, Rochester, and even one was held out in Columbus, Ohio. And these conventions would also add a labor dimension about how to help uh, strengthen the hand of Black workers in the American economy. Uh, but on the, uh, um, and not much on the interracial front where you have a substantial amount of uh, work going on in that respect. So does that address that person's question? Do they have a follow-on? I think so. Uh, thank you, Joe. And Alex, if, if um, you have a follow-up, um, please uh, feel free to just drop it in the chat. Um, we do have another question um, from Tucker, and Tucker is wondering, are there specific challenges for researchers who seek primary sources in this subject, uh, focusing on working class black people in these eras and places, and how can we better tell these stories today? Oh, that's a, that's a very interesting uh, question. Uh, I would say that this is a, a, a field that is right, you know, for, um, it, it, it's almost like there's, you know, Ira Berlin's work, I would suggest that anybody who wants to go into primary research, that they look at Ira Berlin's corpus of scholarship uh, in which he has laid out and worked on primary documents as well as synthesis of the African-American experience. And so all that documentation is embedded in, a lot of that documentation is embedded in his work. And so I think the, the resources are there. And, and the project of recovering all of those Civil War documents and the Reconstruction era beginning to get, you know, more attention as well. I think there's a lot there, you know, that people can work on. I, I would say that a main challenge is that um, people who want to work on the Black working class experience uh, have to really think deeply about how they are going to construe the working class, you know. But there are a lot of people who um, sort of have trouble working between the enslaved working class and the free black working class and white workers. And so I think the challenge will be as much evidence, I mean, as much interpretation as it is evidence. Uh, but I do think the evidence, uh, I don't think we can claim uh, that there is very little to work with. So I, I would suggest that people not shy away. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, Tucker, for that question. Um, I wanted to add um, uh, on to that question and just, I'm wondering if you had any surprises while you were researching for this book. Um, you mean surprises? Yeah, yeah. Were there any big surprises that you had while doing this research? Well, you know, I have been working on some secondary sources, you know, for for quite a, quite quite a long time, and I think maybe the big surprise for me um, had to do with because I'm not a specialist on 19th century Black history or 18th century Black history, so all of that stuff I had to really, you know, think deeply from a 20th century perspective how to make sense of what's what's going on, you know, in this earlier in this earlier period. Uh, but I think that what struck me most is the way in which the 19th century and earlier years produced experiences that resonated with the way African Americans experienced the city in the 20th century. Because I think too often we just sort of block that off as a period that had not so many connections uh, to the 20th century. And I think one of the problems that we have is that we have that whole period between the Civil War and World War I to deal with. And that period is problematic, you know, for people because this is the period of emancipation and the rise and between the, um, the First World War and the rise of Jim Crow. And so I think that you know, people separated the antebellum period of, in part because 
they tried to make sense of this big moment between the Civil War and uh, World War I. And so what I did was to go back and to look you know, more closely at just that urban experience on the ground in the 19th century and try to make sense of that. And the more I did that, the more I was surprised that if we, you know, if we sort of fast forward, you guys heard me say fast forward, you know, I was leaving over all this history between uh, the Civil War and World War I. I jumped right into the 20s. Um, and, and so that's what I would, uh, I would say. And I'm, I'm working on another book uh, that tries to look at these institutional components in more systematic detail. I call this book, Workers on Arrival, a labor history, a history of African-American workers, uh, pretty much grounded in the workplace with some attention to the development of communities as strategies. But in, in this second book I'm working on, I'm, you know, I'm sort of using the groundwork of the workers' experience. But I'm looking, excuse me, I'm looking much closer uh, at these issues of community building and the way Black people constructed this Black city. You know, I, I mentioned it this time. I want to go back and I want to really show that there is an empirically grounded way in which you can begin to see Blacks physically erecting buildings on the landscape. It's not enough to just say they built a church, they did this. I want to find the landscape. Where did they build this church? Did they use their own labor? Did they hire some white workers? Did all the workers uh, working on this early church, were they all slaves or were they all free blacks? So that's the kind of question. And so that surprise, so that for the surprise, it's just a connection between the two periods. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for answering that. I, I know. I know you, you've been doing this work for for a really long time, and and um, and and have have written uh, numerous books um, on on this subject. And 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 um, I'm I'm glad that you that you kind of um, uh, mentioned about fast forwarding because I I would love to to talk a little bit about this current moment and and how it relates. I more specifically, I'm I'm um, I'm interested in your thoughts on the. Um, on the protests in sports, um, because I see that as, a, as an interesting uh, turning point here, um, where, where you have high profile, often black um, uh, uh, yeah. workers, in, in, speaking in the professional realm, um, who, who, were, who were taking a, a, high, a stand. I'm wondering if, if you have thoughts on how that, that might address these issues um, on the larger culture. Yeah, yeah, that's a good um, question, Evan. I, um... I have been thinking about this issue a little bit, uh, but let me tell you what I think. <laughs> That's what you want to know what I think of. Um, I talked about the pre-industrial era or the 19th, 18th century on the one hand, and then I talked about the 20th century on the other hand today. But there is this emerging moment that we might call the emergence of the digital age or the post-industrial age. And the way I'm sort of dating this period is from the late 20th century until the onset of what's happening now, you know, 2020. And I think that uh, when we talk about this age, we need to begin trying to envision a new black working class. And in recent years, some economists have started to talk about what is the most significant job for black men and women today compared to the factory system. When the factory system disappeared, it wiped out a whole economic base uh, and that really impoverished black urban communities and sent them into a set of crises uh, on the ground in the late 20th century. And not only that, the politics of the late 20th century turned evil mean against the social welfare safety nets for people and then left them vulnerable to all of this unregulated kind of economy. And so black people were uh, exposed to that more so than any other segment uh, of the nation's po population. And so, and along with that, you see, you got the whole incarceration system uh, which now more and more scholars are saying the incarceration of young black men and women was a direct response to
for black activism that had emerged out of the black power and civil rights movement. And that was determined to see America eradicate what is now being called systemic racism. It was, it, that kind of talk was early on. And so you got a suppression of organized social justice movements happening at the same time that the, the economy is falling out um, for black people, you know, the bottom is falling out of the economy. And so I think today's challenge and the protest really represents, and I, I know that initially when the Black Lives Matters movement was formed, they, they wanted nothing to do with the idea that they were another civil rights movement and all of that. But, but the Black Lives Matter movement is emerging as a movement that's sort of calibrated to this new emerging moment in African-American and US history and even global history. And I think that one of the dimensions of the protest, that global dimension all over the world and that interracial dimension uh, that it represents, as well as poor and working class people, that this is an important moment in the nation's history. And I think that movement uh, has some promise uh, uh, for us. But I th think it's responding to just the destructive impact of all these changes that are associated with the emergence of this new economy in which black people haven't been able to reorient into. And then the wealth gap is increasing uh, for whites and for blacks. So there's a lot, I think, going on that is suggesting that we're in a different moment uh, in African-American and US labor and working class history. It's complicated, but those are some I thought. And by the way, the question of COVID is, is talking about a lethal policing and exposure to pandemics, all of those things have roots within the early period in African-American history. Uh, but the advent of this new economy, new politics has aggravated uh, those conditions. And now we are at a crisis, a real day-to-day -day crisis on these issues. Certainly. Thank you, thank you, Joe. Um, I, I maybe um, uh, I, I was I was going to ask, and, and um, uh, I'm wondering if you uh, could talk just a little bit more um, to close us out. Um, if you have any further thoughts about um, the Black Lives Matter movement, and and just um, it, are, are there particular things about this movement that give you hope um, um, in addressing these these um, these issues, and and um, also it, are there things that the movement should maybe focus more on um, in your in your opinion. I'd, I'd love to hear what you think about that. Well, you know, you may, you guys, okay, there are other people in the room may have as much to say about this as I do. What I was struck by though, in looking at the uh, way the, the movement shifted with the election of Donald Trump, I have been impressed by the way the movement seemed to be determined uh, to really put pressure on the established political order in no uncertain terms and be unrelenting in a way outside, you know, that democratic, you know, liberal or neoliberal thinking that they were going to really be uh, positioned, you know, pretty heavily on the massive street demonstrations. And they were not going to put too much energy into mobilizing people to vote and put people out of office, that type. But after the Trump election, I just sort of sensed that the Black Lives Matter movement was beginning to come to grips with the idea that, look, there has to be a better context for us to do what we want to do. And if the politics of the country is going to turn right in that way and it's going to become even more repressive, then we have to join forces with people who are trying to create, you know, um, a leadership you know, in American government that gives us a running chance, you know, to get something done. And so now I do see them as being a great catalyst uh, for change in the established electoral uh, process. And I'm sure uh, as they mobilize and help um, unseat uh, Donald Trump, they're gonna ask for something in exchange. And it's not gonna be any small something. They're gonna wanna see some fundamental changes and the Democrats are gonna have to deliver. Uh, uh, otherwise they won't be very long uh, in, uh, political power, but that is what I'm thinking, okay? And that's where I think they are. I think they are strategically placed to really call a lot of shots on how this uh, political thing plays out. 
Thank you. Thank you. I agree. And I, I hope, I hope that's, that's what happens. And I hope the Democrats uh, are, uh, uh, meet it with open, open minds and open hearts. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, thank you so much for being here, Joe. This has really been wonderful. And um, okay. thank um, you. I appreciate it. Our, our pleasure, truly. And all right. th thank okay. you all for joining us. Um, the book is Workers on Arrival, um, Black Labor in the Making of America. Um, you can get it from Booksmith and we'll send it right to you. Um, I hope we can all meet up in um, the nearest future in person. But until then, um, please take care and be well. All right. Thank you.